Now, the scripture reading that we had from today is from the Gospel of John. If you are a Bible scholar, um, and, and most of you are, you'll remember that the Gospel of John does not have a Last Supper observance in the story that he tells of that Thursday night when they got together and they had the, uh, the meal together. Because for the Gospel of John, he has this discussion about what communion is all about. Up here in the sixth chapter of John, and Jesus talks about what it really means that he is going to give himself for us. In the reading that you have, it, you have to kind of put it in the right context. We had the scripture reading, and, and yes, they followed him around the lake. But what, what really had happened? In John, the 6th chapter, verses 1 through 15, Jesus sees the crowd who had followed him into the wilderness as being very hungry and near the point where they're going to have problems if uh, someone doesn't provide them something to eat. And so Jesus and his disciples take five loaves and two fish, and Jesus prays, and they start to pass the food around, and after all the 5,000 men have been fed, they gather up all the scraps of bread that's left, and it's enough to fill 12 baskets full. I don't know what kind of baskets you have, but I don't think they were talking about these little decorations that you have on your kitchen counter. I think they were farmer's baskets. All right? And they filled 12 baskets full of barley bread that Jesus had prayed and provided for the 5,000. As soon as that story is finished, Jesus leaves the crowd and goes away up into the hillside while his disciples get into a boat and head off across the lake of Galilee. They get about halfway. The lake is about seven miles across, something like that. And as they get out to the middle, they run into a stiff wind that holds them in place. It kicks up the waves and it kicks up the wind and it's directly in their face. They cannot make any more progress across the lake. All right? If you're a fisherman on the Sea of Galilee, you've seen those kind of winds very, very often. But it can be just as frustrating. <laughs> The 50th time that you tried to row against the wind, and most of the time they would have just have turned and gone in a different direction and made it a little easier to do that, but they had a place they were trying to go. Well, Jesus realizes they have a problem from where he's standing on the side of the lake, and he walks out across the surface of the water and meets them out in the middle of the lake. They're a little shocked about that. Uh, it wasn't exactly what they were expecting, but after they calmed down a little bit, they led him into the boat. Now this is three, three and a half miles from shore. And the reading of the word says that instantly they were transported to the place along the shore that they were heading to go, intending to go in the very first place. So there's two of the miraculous signs. Uh, John has a, a list of seven miraculous signs. The feeding of the 5,000 is miraculous sign number four, and the walking on the water is miraculous sign number five. And each one had a very important mission to prove that he had power over a certain part of the world that he was here to rule. But then, when we get to verses 25 and following, Jesus begins to teach about why they crowds, the, the people who had followed him around the side of the lake, really didn't understand what was happening. And I think probably that's one of the things that we ought to talk about just a little bit this morning. Because sometimes we think if we pray and we ask God and we go through the right procedures, we can have anything we want to and we can have all the blessings of life. Um, that's what Jesus did. He prayed and there was enough food to feed 5,000. Jesus walked out across the surface of the water. He didn't even get his socks wet. 
I don't know, did they wear socks? I'm not sure. But he wouldn't have had if they had socks. Why? Shouldn't we be able to pray and have the same kinds of things? Jesus said, you're following me because I satisfied your hunger. You haven't hungered for me like you hungered for the bread. I want you, Jesus is telling the people that followed him around the lake, asking for a second miracle of feeding of the 5,000 and 500, because I'm sure they picked up a few friends along the way. They said, feed us again. And in Jesus' heart, he was weeping. Because he looked at them and said, you're hungering for the wrong things. You're hungering for a food that you have to eat again in just a few hours. He taught us in Matthew 25 on the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Who hunger and thirst after an eagerness to be in a loving companionship role with their Lord and their Savior and their Father in heaven. Blessed are those who are hungry, starving, thirsting at the point of death to try and grab onto their Lord and what he gave them and what he did for them and who he has to be in their lives and feed upon him. I'm going to go to the end of the story and I'm going to say, after he got done teaching them, the people all left. They said, his words are too hard. You can't feast on a guy. You can't feast on a person. You can't eat his flesh. You can't drink his blood like he's talking about. That's a waste of time. This is, this is too hard. We're not doing this. And they all walked away. And Jesus turned to his 12 disciples and he said, you guys going to go too? They were down to the faithful few. <laughs> Just a handful. Big crowds all went home. You want to leave me too? Peter turned to Jesus and said, where can we go to find anyone that has the words of life? My friend, I want to share with you today, Jesus is the bread of heaven because he is the one who has the words of life. The bread of heaven, as it's originally described in, in the scripture, is the stuff that we call manna. Uh, the people that came to Jesus to ask for another miraculous sign actually referred to the bread that had come from heaven in the desert. Now, you'll find that all the, what we know about manna comes in the 16th chapter of Exodus. If you want to mark that down, you're, you're welcome to glance back through there and see everything we know about manna it comes in the 16th chapter of Exodus. And it comes about a month or 15 days, somewhere a short time after they had actually left Egypt. And they were now free people and they're heading toward the promised land. They're going to stop for a while at Sinai and receive God's commands. But they're on their own. They've left their homes in Egypt. They've left their bondage in Egypt. And they're headed toward the promised land. Except there's one problem. It's a desert territory. There's no farms or villages around. There's no civilization anywhere. There's no cultivated crops. There's no orchards. There's no vineyards. There's no nothing. And the wagons that they filled in a hurry when they left Egypt are all empty. They're hungry. And they start complaining. And they say, Moses, I don't see an oasis. I don't see a palm tree. I don't see a date tree. I don't see a fig tree. I don't see a grapevine for miles. How in the world are we going to survive our trip through the desert? Did you not think about what it's going to mean that we're all out here in the desert? We're all going to shrivel up and die out here in the sand. Better to have stayed in Egypt. And when Moses realized he didn't have any more food than they did. He went to the Lord and 
made his request. And God said, I'm going to send you bread from heaven. And here's something uh, of what it says in Exodus, the, the 16th chapter, verse 4. God's words, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. Exodus 13, 16, 13. In the morning, there was a layer of dew all around the camp. It was kind of moist, just kind of a, a sparkling, dewy morning. And when the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost were left on the ground after the moisture had evaporated. And it covered the desert floor. Verse 21. And when the sun grew hot, it melted away. Verse 31. It was white like coriander seed and tasted like wafers made with honey. Now, what was it? I don't know. Where'd it come from? I don't know. Uh, what tree produced it? Uh, I, I get the architectural digest and things have for years. In the, in the past, I've had them for years. And one of the big discussions was the migration through the wilderness couldn't have been very many people, and it couldn't have taken 40 years because there's no way they could have supported themselves out in the desert with no cultivation and no crops or nothing else. Uh, so it couldn't have been a very big exodus. It shot probably just a handful of families and kind of wandering around in a while. And so it wasn't very many people because they couldn't support themselves out in the desert. And the scientists are all true. It's absolutely true. You can't. Nomads have trouble surviving out there. And they know it and have lived out there in little small family groups for years, generations. But the Bible said that God provided food in a place where there was no food. He provided something that has a complexity that we don't really understand. Now, I, got, I have a ten-point sermon. Are you ready? I'll run through the ten points, and then we'll have a discussion afterwards, and then we'll share communion. The bread that came from heaven came from a place that they could not see. It didn't come from a tree. Oh, there was one guy that said, I believe it was the dew from a tree. And you could come along the tree and you could scrape the tree and you could get some of the sap that had leaked out on the surface of the bark of the tree. And, and that was probably what manna was. There aren't that many trees in the rainforest in Brazil, let alone down there in the desert. If there is a tree that has something that saps out on the on the surface of it, it not certainly not the manna that we're talking about in the scripture. Manna. It suddenly appeared every morning. And it was miraculous indeed, because it never seen anything like it. In fact, that, that's the name of manna. Manna is the word. What is this stuff? What is it? Man. Okay, that's what we're going to call it. What is this stuff? Nobody could even answer. It came from a place they could not see. It came as it had been foretold and prophesied it would come. God told them the day before it appeared what was going to happen, and it was going to be, the, the, the rules had to be uh, engineered, because there were a lot of rules about manna. All right? You'd only get enough just for today. It didn't keep anything over. It would spoil and rot and be terrible and nasty and ugly smell. And, and yet, when it was like on the day before the Sabbath, you could go out and have two days supply collected. And it would stay all right for the Sabbath day. But if it was any other day and you left a little over in the jar, forget it. You didn't want to use that jar again. It stunk. All right? And when it appeared the next morning, everybody went out and looked at the dew on the ground and they wondered, first of all, what is it? Second of all is, what are we supposed to do with this stuff? Well, just like it was foretold. It was promised to you. God provided it. It came for a very limited time and then it was gone. You only had a certain number of minutes that you could get out from sunup 
to the heat of the day to get your day's supply of matter. Because once the sun came up and was in its full brightness, the manna had just evaporated from sight and it wasn't going to be there for you. It was not for someone to sleep in late on uh, some morning when you didn't have anything that was pushing you too hard because your manna would all be gone and you'd be hungry for the day. The bread from heaven only had a limited time span. It was also a very specific day upon which it started to appear and then there was a very specific day when it stopped appearing. And if you read, uh, the, the people of Israel had crossed over from the, the west side of the Jordan, I'm sorry, from the uh, uh, eastern side of the Jordan over to the western shore, and were ready to attack uh, the, the city of Jericho and the conquest of the promised land. And it was very specifically written in scripture. And this was the last day that manna appeared. Why? Well, because now they were in a garden. There were groves, there were olive uh, vineyards, there were all kinds of places, fig trees and great big clusters. They were in date palm heaven. If you've been down into Jericho, that oasis down in through there and all the fields around it were just abundant and thriving. Why do you need manna when you've got all this abundance on every side? As soon as it wasn't needed anymore, the manna stopped. Something else about manna. It was good. <laughs> it was good. It tasted on your tongue like honey. And I have a little container of honey right next to my, uh, right there on the kitchen counter next to the sink. I like to put a little on just about everything. Oh, it makes a soda cracker so much easier. A little bit of bread and honey. A little honey in, in your tea so that it kind of makes your throat feel. And they had it every single day with that wonderful, robust taste of wonderful honey. And I don't know, it, it, you wouldn't want to necessarily think about what it was like to chew it up, but somehow, whatever it did, it satisfied your hunger. It seemed to just give you that sense that you had had a good meal. And it was... Something where they didn't sit around and say, well, yeah, I'm, I'm not starving to death, but it's sure not easy to feel hungry all the time. No, they were satisfied. They didn't have to complain. It sustained and nourished every physical need. Did, did you see the uh, plate that was published this week? They've come out now. They took away the food pyramid, and they've now made it into a plate where they had the vegetables and the fruit and the and the breads and the grains and the, and the proteins and the dairy and they have got all that right there on the plate that they're supposed to have a full rounded balanced diet. A balanced diet. Well they didn't have a balanced diet. All they had was manna. But you know what? That was enough. And it wasn't a paltry thing either because they went from being a ragtag bunch of slaves to being a warrior people that could win and uh, conquer a nation. They were strong. They were well nourished. They had every one of their four food groups, or five food groups, or however you count those little sections, in one little piece of flake that kind of looked like maybe a frosted flake that a cereal might be today. I don't know. Maybe that's where they got the idea of frosted flakes. But it was good. And they didn't have to sit around taking a bunch of handful of vitamins to try and make up the deficiency. It satisfied every one of their physical needs. Because it was the only thing they ate besides whatever quail flew through as God provided. For 40 years. A whole generation lived, was born, and grew up and ate nothing but manna. And they were strong. Manna had never been seen before. It was unique to the world. And it's never been seen since. The only jar of manna that's still around, that still exists, is hidden in the corner of the Ark of the Covenant, wherever that happens to be. 
Because they took a jar of it and they filled up a portion of it and they put it in there and God said, and it wasn't Bob that said, God said, I'll make sure that it stays good forever. But that's the only stuff you'll ever find. Now when they find the Ark of the Covenant, I'd like to have a little taste. Alright? I have a curiosity about what man will it is a total mystery. Nobody can figure it out. We've got scientists today working in laboratories all around. I mean, we we're finding cures for cancer. We're, hopefully we're going to find a cure for Alzheimer's and some of those complex things. We've already got pills you can take for AIDS and not have to necessarily fade away with some of the drastic, terrible diseases we've had. And with all of the nutrition scientists and all the people working in every lab around the country, they can't find anything at all that comes close to a food that in one single source provides all your needs like manna. And it was good too. Post can't do it. Kellogg's can't do it. It just isn't possible. It's a total mystery. <clears throat> Point number 10. You've been waiting for this one. It came because their father in heaven loved them. <coughs> The only reason for man to exist is that God loved his people and provided for them. God loved his people. He didn't want them suffering. He didn't want them hurting. He didn't want them malnourished. He didn't want them with rickets. Do you remember the, the guys who used to go on the, on the ships, the whalers and things? And, and their legs would get all weak and flimsy and they would get all bow-legged things because they didn't have enough uh, citrus and, and they got rickets. Forty years in the desert without a single uh, lemon, and they didn't get rickets. Go through the whole list. What do you need to stay healthy? It was in that. Now, I have to go back over that same ten points because that's what Jesus said he was. He's called himself the Son of Man. The Son of Man is providing for you. Bread from heaven. True bread from heaven. And everybody looked at him and said, who is this? It's not what is this? It's who is this? Who is this son of man you keep talking about? Who is this person who's got all of this information? Who is this person that's going to provide for us every single thing we need? Who is it? And Jesus simply said, you're looking at it. The one who came from the Father, who knows the Father's heart, who understands the Father, he's going to give you the bread from heaven. It came from a place you cannot see. We know where babies come from. Most of us. Jesus comes from a place we have never known. He didn't have a father like most of us have. He didn't have a daddy that provided the genetic material to start him in the womb. He came from a place that you cannot see. He came as promised and foretold for many, many generations. We read the words of Isaiah this morning. Isaiah is 700 years ahead of Jesus. Understand, listen to it carefully. God always intended to provide for us every single thing we need. Those of us who are willing to follow him are going to be taken care of. It was foretold. It was prophesied. We were promised to it. Jesus came. For a very limited time. And he gave us everything we needed in that three years of ministry. Now you can say, well, I know there's some books written about this and this. And there's some books, there's some experts that talk about other things that should have been in the scriptures. Or here's other stuff. Oh, by the way, did you see there was a guy that prophesied that the end of the world was going to come? He figured it out. It wasn't in the book. He just had figured it out. Have you heard what happened to him recently? Well, it wasn't 
good. He's prefigured, and he, he's going to do it again in October. And if that doesn't work, he'll probably try it in 2012. I hear that's a pretty, pretty popular year these days. Let me tell you a secret. If Jesus didn't say it, it doesn't make any difference. He gave us every single scrap of information we need. And he left nothing out for us to calculate on our Omar calculators. We have everything that we need. It had a known starting date. It may not have been December 25th. We don't know the exact calendar location for that birthday of Jesus, but we know the day he died on Passover Sunday, or on the, the day of preparation for Passover Sunday. He had a very specific starting and ending date. And when he was gone, he was gone. There was no chance to say, uh, let me think about this again and I'll get back to you later. When he was gone, he was gone. And while he was here, it was very good. I remember the two uh, disciples on the way to Emmaus. One of their phrases just really has struck home with me. He just made my heart sing. My heart was burning inside of us as we listened to Jesus talk. They didn't even recognize who it was. But they listened to his voice and their hearts were singing with joy. Burning with excitement. It was very good. And when he spoke... And he took care of us. It satisfied our deepest hungers. Peter was right. Where are you going to go to get satisfied that way? He had the words of life. It sustained every physical need, every spiritual need, every financial need, every need we have, psychological, emotional, social, Jesus Christ is in the business of providing everything we need. It's never been seen before. There's never been anyone like him, and there's never going to be anybody ever come along that's going to say, and I'm just as good. Oh, well, there was a couple of people. Uh, Joseph Smith said he, what, he set up a thing in Utah, and, and then there was that guy uh, you know, set up in South Korea who thinks that uh, they've done better than Jesus. But you know what? Both of those guys died, and they're gone. Jesus is still here doing his work. Never been seen before and never going to be seen again. Anything like it. He is a total mystery. 100% God and 100% man. He understands our deepest need. And yet he comes with every ounce of authority from Almighty God to take care of us. And the only reason he stood before us was because he was sent by a loving Father in heaven to take care of us. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus was the bread of heaven. And you can struggle around, you can find all kinds of other things to think about and spend your time doing. Spend your energy chasing anything you wish to try and satisfy a hunger that won't go away. It won't vanish, it won't disappear until you start to hunger and thirst to be in very close personal fellowship with Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. And then suddenly, you'll find you have energy you never knew you had. You'll have strength. You'll have help. You know, it's good being in the family of God. It's healthy to be in the family of God. People live longer when they're in the family of God. They have more smiles on their faces when they this kind of sounds like the manna that I heard someone talk about, and it tasted like honey in their mouth. Oh, maybe he is the bread of heaven. Sent from a loving father to take care of us. Would you bow your heads for a word of prayer?